Welcome to the to the afternoon and and to our our next speaker. Uh, I don't have enough time to tell you all the accolades that uh, Ike has received in his uh, relatively young career, but um, just you know he's. Uh, probably internationally known as one of the top cataract, complex cataract, and certainly innovative glaucoma surgeries, surgeons in the world. And uh, he deserves that, those, those accolades, because he's really tremendous. When he was here as a fe fellow, and neither one of us can remember the year, <laughs> but we think it's about 2001, probably. Yeah. So it was, it was a really great year in terms of the production here from the, our department. Uh, we had a bunch of videos that won awards, and we actually won the comedy award at the ASCRS for that, that one we did with the me, me, me attempting to jump off the top of the Moran because we dropped a nucleus, remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it wasn't me, but we took credit for it, but it was good. It was all good. Uh, and uh, Ike was listed as one of the top... Uh, the uh, under 40 in all of Canada, top 10, and, and that. And those are awards that are uh, that go to the heart of his intelligence. But for me, the the, the joy of today is in is in the man himself because uh, he's a wonderful human being. Um, he's very analytical, but he shares that with all the world, and that's what's important because you know we need the next generation, and we need we need people that. Uh, not only care about taking care of patients, but care about disseminating information. And uh, I can think of uh, no better example in uh, these complex problems than, than Ike. And also just being always there to help anybody or any surgeon that, that needs help. Puts all this stuff online um, beautifully. And so, you know, that's all. I don't want to say very much because I want to hear him talk. So, Ike. We love you and welcome to the Distinguished Alumnus Award for this year, which is well deserved. So, right? Well, Alan, uh, you know it's it's always such a you know great feeling to be be with you and to be with everybody here. Um, you know, I, I don't know. 2001 is a long time now, I must say, but I, I still feel like a fellow, honestly. <laughs> I used to feel like I got to check in. I feel like I got to go see Candy at her desk. Uh, I, I got to get to clinic in time and, uh, and and find my cubicle to finish my work. Uh, so I'm still looking for it, though. So I heard it's in a neurosurgery building, though, apparently. Um, but 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 this really is, uh, is 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 does feel like it's coming back to home for me. Uh, I do feel I have Utah blood in me, uh, uh, whatever portion that is, and uh, and it's very it's a very sweet feeling. Um, I, it's such a memorable year. I, I spoke to many of you last night, some of you last night, and I shared my feelings, and I'll share them again here about my experience. It really, you know, truly was you know, the best year uh, of my life here, experiencing it here, being at the Moran. I didn't know what to expect. You know, when I, uh, when I, when I it was my last year at University of Toronto, my chairman, uh, fairly conservative man who, you know, insisted on ties and shirts and, and jackets uh, in, in, in clinic. Um, was already, you know, a little bit troubled by my long hair and my unshaven uh, beard, which was, you know, Jeff Petty style, wherever Jeff is. Um, and, and that was back when hipsters weren't cool, so, uh, you know. And uh, it pulled me aside and said, you know, you're going, to, you're, going to, you're going to Utah. It's a very conservative place, you know. Dr. Crandall, you know, I'm sure he's not going to appreciate, you know, your long hair. And so I went to my interview, and uh, Alan, remember, I, I basically cut my hair really short and I shaved, and I, and I walked in, and Alan's Alan like, what the hell happened to you, right, you know? <laughs> So as soon as I saw that, I realized that okay, you know what, we're we're we're, we're in a, we're, you know, we're, we're in a very open place, and no question, it's a very open place, and I was treated wonderfully, and uh, it's just great people. I, I can't I can't say enough about how I feel. I, I I think I offend my University of Toronto faculty and alumni when I feel that I'm actually from University of Utah, and I know that, I know it sounds bad to say that, but but really, I am who I am both professionally and personally because of my year here, wow. uh, and my wife will tell you that as well because of the role models that I have here. Uh, the leadership from the top with Randy, uh, the faculty that I have here, the wonderful people that I have here, and I'm not talking about just the physicians. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about everybody else who works in this, who works in that building, and now I guess works here as well. That was a bit that was a bit more close knit though back in the other building, you know, from all the paramedical staff and the techs and the nurses, uh, and and the administrative staff, the secretarial staff. Uh, Candy, know, Candy knows how I feel about her. 
um, you know, and, and, and the staff that were all part of it. So that, that experience was a wonderful experience and, and it really stayed with me. So it's really an honor to be here. I thank you for the invitation. And uh, I want to stir things up. I know glaucoma sometimes, especially after the, uh, you know, during the postprandial, you know, serotonin release can be a little dry, right? Well, I, I want to shake it up a bit. I, I, want, I want to say a few things that are controversial. Uh, respectfully so. And I want to tell again, especially residents, residents and fellows, you know, ch challenge the norm, right? Challenge the norm, challenge what we do, and that's of course the Utah thing to do here at the Moran. Uh, but do it respectfully, right? Too many, too often we have egos around and we have inflated ideas and uh, brilliant people, but, uh, but, the, but that can get in the way of success, right? And so I think being grounded is very important. And, and I'm not just saying that, I think it really helps you actually to progress. Uh, and I think it's something I learned again being here. I will show my disclosures as well, and I do have the opportunity to work with uh, many folks in, in industry. It's very unusual to have uh, a lot of uh, glaucoma development, in the past at least, but there's a lot of things happening. In fact, in the glaucoma surgical space, there has been over $700 million invested in glaucoma devices, and we've seen companies go public and be worth $1.3 billion. We've seen companies sold for three, $400 million to big strategics. And although it's not about the money, I mean, you realize the money is important to make things happen. You see this in refractive and cataract and retina and other areas as well. Uh, at the same time, and again, I, I'm always very sensitive to the issues around conflict of interest. And let's face it, I mean, when you work with industry, there's a conflict of interest. I mean, we love working with industry, but uh, quite honestly, generally motives are the same, but motives are also different. Shareholders are different. I don't answer to shareholders, right? and, and I never will. Um, I answer to my patients, and that's the most important thing to remember in this as well. So a couple of things I want, I want to just start off and, and say at the beginning. If you think we're treating glaucoma well, I think you're wrong. Or you haven't been in practice for more than 10 years. <laughs> or you move every 10 years. <laughs> if we think that progression is easy to follow, I think we're wrong as well. And there are challenges. And I'll speak to that as well. And I think some of the reasons we're not doing great in glaucoma, and don't worry, we're going to make glaucoma great again, <laughs> is... <laughs> Is sorry, I won't get. I'm not going to get political. I'm sorry. Um, is is IP lowering may not be sufficient. I have to leave the country, so I have to be careful. Um, and I and I love and I love the U.S. and we love we I, and Canada is rooting for the U.S. We want we want things to go well, and I'm sure they will. And 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 that's the beauty of a democracy and and the wonderful opinions we have here. So, is IP lowering, and, and we know that adherence is the problem. So. I think this is a time we're seeing in glaucoma where things are changing. We're becoming interventional in how we think of glaucoma. Uh, we're going from examining the disc, you know, and, and carefully documenting, which is still important, to being active and being, and being preventative in how we treat glaucoma. And I think the drive to lower is better is, I think, something that is resonating or, or has resonated for many years and I think is continuing to show uh, the importance of that, at least for many glaucoma patients. And I think the reason we're seeing this is because we're ha we, are, we have the opportunity now in our hands to have better technology to allow us to do this safer, which, which, is, which will be the premise and the thesis of, of my presentation here. So the first thing as a backdrop, and just a couple of slides, glaucoma progression and blindness is still a problem. You know, data from Rochester, Minneapolis, Minnesota, you can argue about, you know, quality data. This is probably some of our best data, longitudinal follow-up in a, in, a, in, a, in a registry. Um, looking at long-term results, seeing patients have gotten better as far as, we've gotten better at treating glaucoma and preventing blindness. You know, back from pre-1980, one in four eyes went blind. But still, one in eight eyes is still too high. You know, it's one in eight patients going blind in one eye. And that was, that, that was pre-2000. Well, maybe things are a bit better now. We see data coming from Europe, looking at, uh, at, at, at how many patients, when they die, go, are blind. You know, 40% blind in one eye at the time of death. And again, pretty good data from Malamo where they have pretty good records and patients generally going to the same practitioners over time. Data from, from uh, the same group showing, and I wanna, what I wanna show here is the fact that progression, you see, varies patient to patient. Pati some patients progress very fast, some patients progress slowly. And that's the challenge is figuring out who's gonna progress fast, who's gonna progress slow. But overall, again, 90% of patients progress. As Andres Hales will say, the question is not whether your glaucoma patients progress, it's how fast they're progressing. You basically take it for granted they're gonna progress. Some data from prospective from New, prospectively from New York showing 30% progression here over, over six years. 
Some were fast, some were slow. But the bottom line is that there's a big chunk of patients that progress in our practice. And if you follow them long enough, it, it is a problem. And that's the first premise I want to say is I think that's a problem. I, you know, I graduated thinking that, you know, we've got a pretty good handle on glaucoma. We've got all these medications around us uh, that, you know, I'm going to have very few patients that go blind. And as I get in practice, I go 10 years out, I'm, I'm realizing, wow, a lot of my patients are coming back where I thought they were okay, and they're not doing as well. And that made me really think about where we were and, and where we have to be in the future. We have to remember that glaucoma is still the second leading cause of blindness. Uh, and I'm not just talking about people who are not diagnosed or, or not treated. But this is not a new, new concept. You know, back in an editorial written by Morton Grant, talked about why do people with glaucoma go blind? He mentioned, he talked about three things. One, lack of diagnosis. Two, under treatment. And three, poor compliance. And fast forward now, Susan and others writing an editorial again saying, glaucoma is still a cause of blindness, is still underdiagnosed, is still improperly treated, and this, this compliance still is a problem. These, still, these things still remain with us, despite the advances in diagnostics. And I think they went further, talking about the severity of damage is underestimated, that pressure is still not reduced low enough, we don't understand peaks and means of IOP properly, and evaluation of progression is still a problem, it's still difficult. And so, the premise of where I think we're going in glaucoma, and again, I will say I could be wrong, is I think our guidelines for treatment and target IOPs are off. I think they're wrong. Target IOPs are not based on evidence, they're based on consensus. But consensus is based on what people are comfortable doing to patients, understandably. And that's limited by what we have access to. I think that we need to be driving pressures to the low end of normal, just like with diabetes and with hypertension. I think that's the true place where glaucoma needs to be. But the problem is adherence, and until recently we didn't have some of these better options in front of us. I look at it like this. We're in the internet age, right? Some of you are passive, you kind of just you know, surf online, just watching, lurking around. And others are like, you know, active. They're clicking on every pop-up that comes up. And you're, you're, the, you're the people who have those viruses on your computer, right? <laughs> so probably not, none, of those, none of those are great, but let's face it, glaucoma in general has been a bit passive. And I'm not putting anyone down or not condemning the way, the way we treat glaucoma. I, I, I'm a glaucoma specialist, and that's the way I, I generally have looked at glaucoma. And I think we need to think about being, being active. How many know about the EMGT trial? I'm sure, I'm sure this is something that's, that's uh, talked a lot about, right, you know, and, and, and still talked about. Who wants, to, who wants to put up and tell me, what, what's the take-home message from the EMGT trial? What's your one take-home message? Residents, fellows? Anybody? I told you it's going to be interactive. <laughs> Keep you awake. Anyone with their eyes closed? Spit it out. Lower IOP is better, right? Lower IOP is better, I hear. Yep. Tre Norm. What, what, year, what year resident are you? <laughs> Very young guy. <laughs> yes, Norm. They, they, they all progress. Yes. And, uh, you know, and even with the 20% lowering, I think the, the, the thing that is the take home for me is that, yeah, 20% lowering is helped, but they all just progress and progress quite a bit. I agree, Norm. Exactly. My same feelings. I mean, yes, the, yes, the byline was treatment lowers progression from 76 to 60%. But 60% of patients, as Norm said, still progressed. And this was a, you know, 25% IP reduction, which most guidelines would be, that's what, that's what you treat glaucoma. 25% reduction is usually a target for glaucoma. If you look at the uh, European, previously at least, the Canadian uh, guidelines, that's what the drop is. But the take home message is, yes, treatment of glaucoma with a fairly reasonable IP reduction we think is reasonable, Patients still progress, and that's exactly the point I took home as well. And in fact, from the EMTT trial, as you follow these patients, 30% had low vision or blindness after 20-year follow-up in the EMTT trial. And this very good data, this is, very, this is a very important study to look at, particularly for natural history and for that reason. How many have heard, how many have just seen, saw the recent Lancet publication from David Garwright Heath talking about the UK glaucoma treatment study? Take home message there was latanoprost is more effective than placebo at one year in preventing progression. The pressure reduction you see here was uh, about 20% drop in IOP. And these were early glaucoma folks. These were, er this is not advanced glaucoma. And, and, and ne neither was EMGT. These were not advanced patients. And most people in the art room would, would, would agree, advanced glaucoma, get them low. These are not advanced glaucoma patients. These were very early in treatment. 
And, and yes, there was a difference in the rate of progression between both groups, uh, as, as we saw. But again, you look at the treatment group, the treatment group here, right? In one year, with a mild glaucoma disease, 20% progressed. That's at one year, right? So these studies are interesting. They show treatment helps, which I think is good to see this. But it doesn't help enough. And the question is, why are people still progressing? And there's no question there are non-IOP factors as well. We're sure of that. But I think we have to ask ourselves again, is why do we see tonus progression in a treatment arm, right? There's something wrong with this picture here, right? OK? Something doesn't fit right here. Well, I think we have to think about inadequate pressure reduction. And we see the relative risk of progression go down per millimeter of mercury reduction. Now, this is statistical analysis here, statistical you know, an, uh, you know, sh you know, uh, assignment here. But we do see anywhere from 10 to 20% reduction of risk per millimeter of mercury IOP reduction. And we see uh, a, a fairly uh, you know, dose response relationship to percent IOP reduction and visual field preservation. This is not necessarily new. Back, Oldberg, and Oldberg uh, published a study in the 80s uh, showing patients who kept pressures below 15 had less progression compared to patients who were not. This was more an advanced glaucoma, mind you. And surgical patients did better than medical patients. And in the Canadian glaucoma study, which basically was a prospective study, randomizing, not randomizing, basically treating patients here, following patients over time, and you can see basically 30% of patients still progressed. And again, I want to mention here again, this is early glaucoma. This is not advanced glaucoma. This is not moderate glaucoma even. This is early glaucoma. But as you can, you can, if you see, and this was, you know, the mean treatment uh, was down to about 14.8 millimeters of mercury, right? But if you, if you look at the tertiles, the patients that had less than 15 had less progression than patients that were greater than 17. And again, showing that, you know, IOP still plays a role in terms of progression. And of course, there's a very well played, maybe overplayed, Aegis data, Aegis 7, showing that patients who are maintained at a pressure of, on average of 12, or at least 100% less than 18, tend to have very stable visual fields. Now, by the way, although this is called advanced glaucoma intervention study, all these patients did not have advanced glaucoma. They had, there was a mix of glaucoma patients in this group. But you again see a difference in that. And that's why those of you who watch TV a lot know the uh, hit HBO TV series, Orange is the New Black. Well, remember, 12 is a new 21, right? <laughs> You know, remember, 21 was the target many years ago, and then, we, you know, I think gradually we thought, okay, ages got published, 18 should be better, right? We're kind of lower, lowering the targets a bit. And is 12 the promised land? That's the question I'm going to ask you here. Is that, is that the promised land for glaucoma? Will we stop all progression? Is this for everybody or only for advanced patients? Do we need to even have target IOP if everyone should be down to that level? And is, there only, is surgery the only way to get there? So... Let's flip around and talk about diabetes and hypertension, right? You know, there's data that's coming out and that's coming out already that shows that tighter glycemic control and keeping blood sugar at the lower end of the targets results in less end organ damage. The problem was to get there, we had a higher risk of hypoglycemia, right? You know, and, and, the, and the problems around that. Now that there's continuous monitoring, continuous infusion pumps and things like that, keeping blood sugar under tight control at a low level, in a chronic disease, we see less progression. Same thing in hypertension as well. So we're seeing, again, some similarities between chronic glaucoma and chronic disease systemically as well, which I think plays a pattern. Until we have the ability to do that, though, it becomes hard to promote that. So the question is, who do we need to be aggressive with for pressure lowering? And is it only an advanced glaucoma? So first of all, I'm not talking about fake glaucoma, OK? All right? <laughs> Just to be clear, not fake glaucoma, OK? All right? So I don't care what the media says, I'm not going to fake glaucoma, okay? I'm talking about real glaucoma here, okay? So I'm not talking about alcohol hypertension. I'm not talking about, you know, very, very early disease. I'm talking about real manifest glaucoma. They have a visual field defect at the very least. We'll talk about that. Uh, I can't go that farther and talk about, uh, you know, other early cases. Maybe there's a reason for that. But I'm talking about patients who have real manifest glaucoma. And, of course, life expectancy also plays a role. The other thing to remember, this, and I can't, I, cannot, I cannot take credit for this quote. This is from Francisco Goni. But glaucoma is only young once, right? Think about that. 
and you know, when you're, when you're young, you really have one chance to kind of, you know, set the tone for how your future goes. And we have to get it right the first time, ideally. Now, there's obviously patients that are at risk that we're going to be more concerned about. Progressive patients, pseudoxfoliation patients, patients who have lost disease, and lost the eye, one eye to glaucoma already, strong family history. And for me, it's the younger patient who has more than early disease. That's the one I really, really worry about. Now, I guess you can question what, what, what the definition of young means. But I can tell you, we're seeing a lot of patients, 80, 80 to 90 year olds, uh, that uh, we're doing surgery on and, and, are, and are in our clinics. And I think we, we, have, we are readjusting what young means. But particularly, again, the young 55, 60 year old patient that comes in with, with a visual field defect, I, I worry about that patient long term. I worry about this patient who has shown clear progression. This, this to me is not the patient that we simply add another drop to and say, okay, we're gonna, re, we're gonna add another drop to and follow you up and continue following up every six months and every few years. This is the kind of patient that I think really is in danger and needs to be treated. And although right now glaucoma is traditionally treated in the stepwise approach, we have modest pressure targets. We then follow patients with measures I believe are not great, visual field variability up and down, even OCT and RNFL analysis, I think not so robust in terms of progression analysis. I still think we need to have a lot of work on that. And when we do see progression, we, we, we repeat testing and follow patients again and again, and then we really treat them when really, we really escalate therapy if there's progression to another target. And I think that the alternative approach, we'll call it, is to consider going and get to getting down early and protecting that, protecting that patient uh, and avoiding some of the issues. And here's the problem with glaucoma. And I hope you're following me a little bit here, because I'm gonna get the surgery, don't worry. But I'm setting this up here. IOP is very random. I mean, we measure IOP in the clinic, like, who knows what's happening all throughout the day? Peak IOP, we don't, we don't have a clue on. We can do diurnal tension curves, but how, but how realistic is that overnight? Severity is underappreciated. I mean, what does advanced glaucoma mean? Right? I mean, we have a cupped out nerve with a normal visual field. Does that patient have early glaucoma? I, I, don't, I, don't, I would not think so. And I think progression lags, and I don't think it's easy to monitor. I think that's part of the problem. And that's part of the problem with target IOP. Now, I didn't just put the slide up here because I'm in Utah, but <laughs> I'm serious, I didn't, I didn't, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, I, think, I think target IOP is a bit complicated, right? It's a bit complicated, right, I think. And, you know, Canadian guidelines, you see mild, moderate, severe glaucoma, pressure targets, I think a lot of us would argue those targets seem to be a little bit, you know, high on, high on a level. It's because, again, what evidence do we have on this? The European guidelines, again, very, to me is very vague, right? Higher target, lower target, based on severity of damage. Well, severity of damage, as I already said, I think it's hard to know. I mean, advanced glaucoma based on the visual field, is that really telling us the true, true amount of damage to the nerve? Life expectancy is hard to figure out. Untreated IOP, do we really know what it is? Additional risk factors, yes, but, and, then, and, then, and then looking at progression. So one of the things I think that's very important from a, from a, from a a target pressure perspective, those of you who believe in target IOP, and I, I'm not saying I don't believe in it, but is determine a patient's rate of progression. That's what, that's what, that's what, that's what, that's what, that's what we talk about. Follow a patient, see how they're progressing, and then tailor your treatment to that. Well, I think there's a bit of a problem with that. I think one problem is, I think, first of all, to get reliable progression indices is hard, as I said earlier. I think that progression is not always linear. You know, we see, that, we see this happen where patients, you know, showing a certain level of, uh, uh, of uh, visual field index, and then they just drop. And I think that's part of the problem, basically, by being, you know, by being watchful waiting here. I understand that, though, because the alternative is, is not necessarily ideal either, in terms of putting through patients through surgery we're not comfortable with, or adding a whole boatload of medications. But I'll tell you, when you're not confident, what do we do when we're not confident? We all do this. We tend to withdraw, we tend to watch, we tend to get a bit paralyzed, we procrastinate the decision making, we punt it off. I'm not gonna get in trouble if I don't you know, treat a patient aggressively with glaucoma next year, because the patient's not gonna go blind next year. But if I do surgery and something happens, and now it's on, it's on my watch. And that's, that makes us obviously very conservative. The same thing again we saw with cataract surgery. Let's put it off, wait till the cataract gets ripe, and then do surgery, because I think obviously uh, the risk and benefit and the morbidity was a concern for put, t taking out cataracts that were mild in nature. Uh, in the past. How many of you decide when someone has glaucoma to watch them, for, for, to watch for progression? So you have a patient, pressure is 25, uh, they're a young, young patient, they have a nerve, they have visual field damage, and 
you decide to treat them or not treat them. Anyone, would anyone watch them over a few years to, to see whether they progress? Nobody would do that. 25 and a visual field defect. Already. Yes, a clear defect, critical component is damaged, you would treat them. Yeah. And you treat them because the risk of progression is so high in untreated population, right? 90% in pseudo-exfoliation, 74% in, um, in, uh, in high pressure glaucoma, 56% a bit less in normal tension glaucoma. You know, maybe normal pressure glaucoma, you could argue a bit on that one because it can be very slow in some older patients. But let's talk about high pressure glaucoma. You wouldn't, you you wouldn't watch them till, till they progress, right? But, but why do we watch our treated patients to progress? Do you, do you follow me? Because we're doing the same thing, right? We're treating them modestly. We're saying we're gonna watch you. Well, the progression rates are almost the same as patients who are not treated in some ways. They're better, but they're, they're there. So, so think about that. Think about that. We're, we're purposely watching a patient. We know, we know it's gonna progress because we have data to support that even. And this is a bit of a complicated slide, but my point here is again that reliability, variability, repetitive phenomena, uh, the lag period are all challenges with using visual fields to analyze for progression. And as I said, imaging is also a challenge. Now, we have to remember in glaucoma, it's not like refractive cataract, refractive or cataract surgery. We're, thinking about, we're looking at the long game. We need to think like the 10, 15, 20 year horizon for our patients. And what we do now has an impact on what happens in the future for good and for better. And whether we decide to be aggressive or not, or intervene or not, that has implications for this patient in the long run. And if you only consider short-term trials, which is five years or less, or three years in glaucoma, that's too short to give you enough evidence or enough idea about the implications of long-term treatment. And I, know, I realize it's hard. I realize it's hard to do that. And so, you know, I think there is a drive to consider to, be low, to get low on the normal, conceptually, um, not just for advanced glaucoma, I think we need to reframe and rethink our targets. Uh, but we have to also ensure we don't compromise adherence. That's a big problem, and we'll talk about that shortly as well. And I think this is where we think about what the options are beyond medications here. I know many of you will add three or four medications to a patient. Someone's pressure is about 16, 17, you're worried about them, you add a third or fourth class. Well, it turns out, as, as, as some of you may, may think about as well, adding a third or fourth class doesn't do a lot for most of our patients to get a meaningful drop in pressure. There are statistical reasons for that, and there are also pharmacological reasons for that, but the bottom line is that don't expect a lot by adding a third or fourth drop. We often do it, I understand. It feels good. We're doing something, we're being proactive. Maybe we'll get a millimeter, which is a measurement of, of error with the tonometry, uh, but, th but that's part of the problem. We also know that medical therapy also impacts glaucoma surgery, and patients who are more heavily medicated have a, a lower success rate than patients who have surgery primarily. And I think it's well established that the toxicity of medications, are not only conjunctiva, but also trabecular meshwork, and also the episcleral vasculature, and also supracortical space, by the way, as well, medications and the toxicity have an impact. And this has an impact on the success of surgery. Yet another reason to think about that. Another aspect to think about medications are that at any given pressure, a surgical pressure of 13 is less likely to fluctuate than a medicated pressure of 13, assuming patient is compliant even. That's because, again, considering peaks and troughs of medications. Less fluctuation, less peak IOPs with surgery as well. And whether we buy all those things or not, we know, regardless of those issues, compliance remains consistently to be a problem. No matter where we look in the world, compliance is a major unmet need and a major problem. And not only compliance, but even getting the drop in the eye, <laughs> right? I mean, whether it's the marination technique or the dive bomb technique, I mean, it, it gets pretty messy, okay? But here's the, reality, the sobering reality. When our patients are not compliant and not adherent, right, sorry, this is after lunch, I know. Um, when they're not compliant and they're not adherent, they progress. And I'm not saying that just because it makes sense theoretically. We have good data to show that. And you know, from a health systems perspective, when they progress, they cost the system more money. They cost us all as taxpayers more money to take care of more advanced coma patients when they progress. So addressing adherence is not only a patient issue, not only an institutional issue, a site issue, it's beyond that as far as implications. So we know that surgery has a better chance of getting lower. We know we address adherence. We know if we do it earlier, there's less chance of failure because of toxicity from medications. We know that the costs are less in the long term. But the question has always been recovery and risks. 
And one of the reasons why I, I, I thought about glaucoma as a career and I came to the Moran is because I felt, despite the trend to go into retina and cornea and everything else, I thought there was a real opportunity in glaucoma to think differently and think about something differently. And one of the reasons I came here was to, to work with that mindset. And of course, we have a long way to go. I've already addressed some of these issues in terms of surgical considerations. And I think it's important to remember again that we're still evolving. We're still, we're still rethinking about what the role of primary surgery is. And these are the kind of things I want, I want, to, I want to mention. Now, this is how, we cur how many of us currently treat glaucoma surgically. We operate late in the disease process, right? We try to push it off. And when we push it off, we typically find less predictability with our procedures and we have more complications. And as human nature is, what do we do? The next patient we see, we're even more timid and we push it off even more. It's the vicious cycle that we must break if we are to really truly revolutionize treatment and hopefully have less patients progress, right? It, we truly have to do that. Uh, that's the battle cry for glaucoma. And anybody who knows it does surgery, if you're not a confident surgeon, it affects your decision making in a major way, right? Cataract surgery in the old times when the results were unpredictable, recovery was long, refractive results were long. There were some very good surgeons out there, but still, most were not jumping in and do cataract surgery early for 20, 40, 20, 40, 20, 30 cataracts. Now, it's not, never a question hardly, right? Because the confidence and the, and the predictability is so good, and that's what we really are looking for. And again, it's about being reactive versus being proactive. And we really need to be proactive as best as we can for a very blind disease. So the Cochrane Review did review medical versus surgical intervention. And what they basically determined was, in at least three trials, and this was, these, these trials are more in severe glaucoma, they found that surgery as, pri as a primary choice resulted in less progression over a long period of time than medications. And even the NICE guidelines, which are European guidelines, in their actual guidelines, actually advocate for at least consideration for surgery as a primary choice for advanced glaucoma. As a primary choice for advanced glaucoma. For early glaucoma, the thing is still, is, still under, is still under treatment here, and I would even debate that from a moderate disease, but at least for advanced glaucoma, that's what, that's what the guidelines, that's what the evidence is, is basically in this in this uh, guideline. Back, back uh, again in the, in the late 80s, the Glasgow group showed uh, that progression was less in TRAB versus medications. And by the way, this is TRAB surgery we're talking about, but this is also medications back from the 80s, which also is very different than now. That's why, that's why some of these studies have been criticized as far as how much can you apply it nowadays. The Moorfield's primary, primary therapy trial, again, comparing uh, randomizing laser versus meds versus TRAB, again, done many years ago, showed better pressure reduction in the surgery group, showed uh, less progression in the surgery group compared to medications and lasers. Um, and showed, again, more stable visual fields over time in surgery. Now, this did not necessarily take hold in worldwide because new medications came on board, because this was a, you know, one center, and uh, did, not, did, not, did not receive widespread adoption. Now, the CIGIS trial, which was, of course, an American-based study, collaborative initial glaucoma treatment study, comparing surgery versus medications, again, prospectively here, Monomycin TRAB versus medical therapy, as expected, the surgical group had a lower pressure of around 15 than the medicated group. Overall, the results on visual fear were the same. So the overall message was that medications are similar to surgery as primary therapy. That's what, that's what the conclusion was. But if you look at the data in more detail and separate patients with very, very early disease, they're about the same. Although if you follow this line, you follow, you follow the medication line, you see it kind of dripping down a bit over time, but certainly no difference over the nine years here. But the surgery group is where we really saw a difference here in patients who had modest visual field damage. I'm not talking about minus 15 decibel loss. We're talking about minus eight, minus 10 decibel loss. And we see how surgery had much more stable visual fields than medical, medical therapy. Despite that, and, and by the way, uh, optic nerve progression, was more common in medicated group overall compared to surgery. Certainly there's evidence here, at least for primary therapy for patients who have, you know, modest glaucoma to advanced glaucoma should be considered as primary therapy. But the reality is that most physicians, whether they're glaucoma specialists or, or whether they're 
comprehensive ophthalmologists are reluctant to recommend primary surgery. They're reluctant. And I'm sure this also applies to, uh, to North America. This is, this is from, uh, from, from, from England. But most are willing to change their attitude if evidence supports surgery as a safer option. What about patients? Well, patients actually are not as concerned about the method of how you lower the pressure. Their bigger concern is they don't want to go blind. And so for, from their perspective, if surgery can reach that, most of these studies have shown patients are pretty satisfied with surgery. And this is actually trap surgery. This is not new surgery. This is trap surgery. Uh, it only could, could potentially get better from that aspect with, um, with, uh, with, with potentially newer surgeries. So despite all this, despite all this, trap numbers have been going down over, over the last 20 years. There's many reasons for that we can imagine. And we also see again uh, the same phenomena in, in the UK. So as I said before, we are going to think, make, we are going to change things here, right? <laughs> okay. But what will it take for us to establish surgery to become the norm? Well, it's like, again, cataract surgery. I mean, we have to address the issues around invasiveness, safety, recovery, refractive changes, and all the rest of it around, around surgery. And, and, you know, safety really, <laughs> safety is really where this, is, where this is about, right? You know, Dr. Shakur, you know, where this, you know where this picture was taken from? Northern Pakistan, man. Only in Pakistan, right? Okay, all right. And it's the shift. It's the very shift to surgery. And I'm from Pakistan, so I can talk about Pakistan. I'm not well. The shift to safer glaucoma surgery has resulted, I think, in the ability to allow us to shift our targets. And no question, we see the uptake of newer procedures over the last two, three years um, in the United States. And I really think that, that we're upon this, uh, this phenomenon of interventional glaucoma, which basically is intervening early in disease, addressing compliance, treating, again, patients who, really, who are more than early disease, and being proactive than, than being reactive. And I think sustained drug, drug, drug delivery is exciting and coming up. I think that safer bleb surgery allows us to be more aggressive earlier on. And of course, mixed surgery when it comes to cataract surgery, of course, uh, is another aspect to address some of these issues. And that's the premise of surgery, intervening early, avoiding, long, avoiding having to deal with potentially very high risk surgery, addressing compliance, stepwise approach. Now I will say this is still very early. This is somewhat more of a crystal ball talk in some ways because I think we obviously need to have more evidence, uh, but I'm, gonna, I'm making my case here on this one. And this is kind of where MIGS kind of you know, came about initially as, an, as, an, as a potentially a, a safer, less risky, uh, more stable, refractive, a more uh, standardized recovery period and, and you know, occupying an area between uh, medications and, and surgery. I, I think you know, we can certainly say that I think MIGS has a role in perhaps all of these areas, in whether it's early or late, late onset uh, disease. And the concept of new MIGS surgery is not just about lowering pressure, but it's also about medication reduction as well, which I think for many of us in glaucoma surgery, we're not really, we don't need to talk in those terms. We're talking about absolute IOP terms typically when medications I think are very important to address from a patient perspective and from a compliance perspective as well. So MIGS is a very crowded space now. We have internal devices into the canal. We have supraciliary procedures and we have uh, uh, subconductile procedures. I call these internal and I call these uh, ex extra MIGS, a bit more extra pressure lowering but also some, uh, also some additional post-operative considerations while internal um, uh, of course, is more of an internal aspect of drainage. And a lot of the stuff really came out of the cardiovascular world. All of the engineers that I had, I had the opportunity to work with and, and scientists came actually out of the stenting world and coronary artery disease and applied, applied things to, uh, to glaucoma. And I do think, again, that you know, uh, when it comes to cataract surgery, safety is paramount. And when it comes to standalone procedure, of course, safety and efficacy are, are both, of course, important in managing these cases. Because we know FACO. FACO does lower pressure, so I don't think we can doubt that. But the ability to combine something to FACO to get additional lowering or additional medication reduction is where some of the MIGs play. And I certainly think that when I look at a patient with cataracts, it's very much like a patient with astigmatism. If I'm thinking about someone who has cataracts with astigmatism, I at least will consider a toric lens. I think it would be something to strongly to consider. When someone has cataract surgery and they're going for glaucoma, I think at least MIGs or something along this line is worth considering at least with the added propensity to potentially get patients off medication. Now, MIGs are, no, are not perfect. One of the problems with MIGs is, and some of the MIGs is, is we don't get low enough for many patients. But for many patients, particularly early in disease, uh, and with the goal of eliminating medications, 
going internally, whether it's stenting, dilating, or cutting, or going into supertary space, I think are both reasonable options. And, and now in the US, of course, you have new devices that have been approved. You have the ability to divert aqueous or enhance aqueous to the Shems Canal versus supercellular space. I'm not gonna tell you here which one is better or which one is superior. I think they both have their potentially pros and cons with regards to efficacy, with regards to effort, with regards to safety. We have to remember, of course, when it comes to the canal, that we have to deal, of course, in bypassing the TM. But we have to also assume that the distal outflow pathway is intact. We assume once we bypass the trabecular meshwork and the canal, that the distal outflow, all those very fine aqueous veins and plexus are still intact. And there's mounting evidence that in some patients with glaucoma, that the disease may be beyond the canal. There may be distal disease secondarily, perhaps, to the initial problem. And as I said, there are a variety of options when it comes to the canal space. We have cutting procedures, we have dilation procedures, uh, and we have goniotomy procedures. So now in the US, you have a lot of options available to us, and it gets very confusing between picking one versus the other. And I'll tell you that I think each of them, again, have their own pros and cons. I will think, I will, I will of course, uh, tell you that, of course, whenever we're cutting, we're inducing more trauma, there's more risk of iphema, PAS, and the body of evidence, I think, is still lacking, of course, in many of these areas. Of course, the ice has been around for the longest. It's been the most heavily marketed. And by the way, as an aside, I mean, I love working in the industry, but I, I'm not necessarily big fans of marketing machines. Uh, again, sometimes uh, uh, the marketing is about, you know, well, I won't, I won't go too far on that. Um, but, but do distinguish what is reality and what is marketing. I think marketing, of course, is important to get the word out, but do your own homework to figure out what does what. Uh, and that means, again, going back to the studies and, and, and talking to uh, uh, clinicians and scientists. So, you know, a very beautiful, elegant procedure. I mean, I love working in the canal. And by the way, the rest of it is normal we see, when we see this. We expect to see blood reflux from the episcleral venous, uh, you know, uh, venous return. There's, a, there's some nice tripan blue showing the uptake in the aqueous veins that are innervated by those two stents, showing proof on the table of, uh, of a nice uh, outflow. But remember, we still have the episcleral venous resistance that limits our ability to lower pressure below that level. And we can debate what that level means. But there's good data to show that putting eye stents in with FACO, and I'm sorry in the US you only have the ability to put one in right now, at least uh, in terms of on label with cataract surgery, but does show a, a reduction in pressure compared to FACO alone, and does show a uh, reduction in medications compared to FACO alone, and does show enhanced outflow facility uh, measuring floor photometry as well. So I think, I think that there's not a lot of debate in my mind whether it works or not. The question is, can we make it work better? And are there certain patients that would do better than others? And we're excited to see scaffolding devices come about and newer devices come about in the future uh, that may also enhance outflow by also expanding the space as well. And then we have the supracoroidal, supraciliary outflow pathway, uvascular outflow pathway. This procedure uh, is fairly intuitive essentially placing this guide wire, uh, disinserting the ciliary body uh, attachment, and placing this device in the supraciliary space. One of the advantages in supraciliary space is we don't have the episodal venous floor to limit pressure reduction. But one of the disadvantages in supraciliary space is that there is more healing that we have to deal with and more variability in the response compared to in the canal, to, to, compared to a vascular space. Uh, and so uh, this is again where I think time will tell and show us the differentiation between these procedures. But they're very, you know, fairly elegant procedures that we do and often co typically combine with cataract surgery. And we do that because the IOP lowering is somewhat, somewhat limited. And to justify going in, we're already going into the IR already with cataract surgery and we can basically then achieve uh, a bigger response. Uh, this was the two-year uh, study uh, looking at the supercellular microstent versus FACO alone. First of all, FACO lowers pressure. That's the one message here, right? The control group, you know, off medications, you know, 44% of two years reached target pressure in this population. Not bad for FACO alone, considering the mean washed out pressure was about 24.5 millimeters of mercury. Not bad for FACO alone. Adding the device did improve though, however, the odds of getting there. And my suggestion is when we talk to our patients, don't give them means, don't give them averages or standard deviations, give them probabilities. Mrs. Jones, I could do procedure A, the probability of reaching this result is 70% versus procedure B, which is 40%. Let's look at the risk and benefit of this and choose the right process. Uh, same thing for an IOL, right? I mean, th this is, I think, more, more practical and relevant to our patients. 
But, it, but the question still comes back to me, you know, to bleb or not to bleb. And I can tell you that over the last five years, I've done more bleb surgery than ever before. Even though I, I, I started my career saying I want to retire the bleb, right? So the bleb is back. Or once you, do, once you, once you go bleb, you never go back, right? Is that how it goes? <laughs> because the bleb is still the best way to get pressures down to that elusive target of 12. Going internally, we're not there yet. Maybe if we get some wound healing modulation in the supracordial space, we can get lower. But still, for our patients who really need this, like I said, the patients earlier I talked about in the earlier part of my talk, we need this. Now, we also know blebs are also not the same. Blebs can vary in how they look, right? Many of it is surgical technique as well related, and also the application of antifibrotics. There are many ways nowadays to create a bleb. Trabs, express devices, non penetrating surgery, large tube shunts, and now we're in the era of microstenting blebs. We all would agree that a, a bleb around a bear belt is very different than a bleb after a trap, right? And, and, that's, and I think we're seeing differences in morphologies. And these blebs are typically not your father's bleb, right? The old Oldsmobile commercial, right? It was a grandfather, father, whatever, you know. Uh, these blebs tend to be posterior, diffuse, and with mitomycin uh, tend to, again, be non-cystic and non-threatening. Uh, and that's because, again, of the diversion of aqueous posteriorly, which is where we want these blebs to be. The, the, uh, the Zen stent uh, is an ab internal delivery device. Uh, we studied this a lot. We went through a lot of uh, iterations. Uh, one thing we looked at was uh, fluid dynamics, because, of course, having an unguarded procedure, we worry about hypotony. Well, using the hagen Pocell's equation, looking at uh, flow testing as well, assuming uh, you know, a certain uh, flow, uh, flow production of aqueous by, this, by addressing the radius, of curve, radius, radius of the lumen, the diameter of the lumen, and the length of the device, we were able to titrate the flow to achieve a steady state pressure of 7.5 millimeter of mercury, assuming normal aqueous production. And that's, particu that's, a, that's particularly important when it comes to early hypotony, protecting from early hypotony. In, er in order, again, to allow this device to be used earlier in disease or to be safe to use, we have to address that. Now, this is a procedure being implanted. The needle passes through, delivers the uh, microstent in the subcon space, uh, and con communicates the AC to the, to the subcon space. Typically, we inject mitomycin C prior to the, the delivery. Now, it turns out it's not as simple as this. It turns out that where the implant sits in, in, the, in the subcon space can make a difference, I think. We see some patients do great with this procedure, other patients that don't do a well procedure. I think a lot of it is where the device is in relation to T knots. We're studying that. So stay tuned, but uh, again, it's obviously more than what you see as far as just simply do it anywhere in the space and you're done. Placing the needle in the right space, typically super tenons, I think is important. And these blebs, again, in, the, in, these, in these patients, dif diffuse posterior uh, with, with fairly good pressure lowering, competing with traps. And the European prospective study, the APEX study, showed pressures are getting down to that 13, 14 level. Uh, so it may not be as low as getting down to single digits like a trap, although I think I would challenge uh, those who, who would feel uh, that we can get down that low with a trap even consistently. The uh, primary two versus trap study that just got presented at AGS had an average pressure of around 13.5 or so uh, at one year. Uh, and again, most importantly, showing high degree of safety uh, with this device. Our data from Canada very similar. I will point out, however, we did have a, a fairly high needling rate, and I think a lot of this has to do, again, with trying to deal with where the device is in relationship to T-nons. Uh, because if the device is placed in T-nons with only one outlet, there's higher resistance in T-nons, which I think does limit the flow. Recently, we had one of our papers accepted uh, in ophthalmology, which will be published soon. Uh, this is a retrospective study looking, comparing the uh, microstent versus trabeculectomy in uh, over 350 eyes, robust analysis here uh, internationally, basically showing success rate fairly similar between both groups, uh, achieving pressure between 6 to 17, 6 to 21, and even 6 to 14, showing similar numbers. The InFocus device is another device here. This device is a little different. Uh, this is made of a special material called SIBS, which is a, which is a, a, a synthetic material that's been used in the coronary artery world. Uh, very limited bioreactivity. This device just plays ab external. You may say, well, why would I do this if I can do an ab internal delivery? Well, the advantage of this is part of the disadvantage of this procedure is the advantage because we can place it exactly under tenons or where we want to place it as opposed to delivering with a needle ab, ab, ab internal and not being sure where the placement is. 
We, we have found uh, uh, tremendous IP lowering with this procedure and, and found tremendous safety with this procedure. The control of this procedure is, is very eloquent. The blebs are posterior. And this is published work from Juan Baye. I mean, pressures that are really unbelievable. We, we don't believe some of this data. Uh, seeing how low we get after three years uh, in, in, in a population that isn't necessarily the lowest risk population. But I can tell you, when I look at our Canadian data, and we, can, and we look at it comparatively, we're finding the same, same experience. And it's really changed my opinion of, of how BLEBS uh, can be. I, I, have, I have now much more confidence uh, when, I, when, I, when I do a, uh, these, one of these BLEB procedures than when I do a TRAP. I know they're going to see 20, 30, 20, 40 in the, in the first few days after surgery. I know their chamber is going to be deep and well formed. I know the, I know the cores are going to be rare. If they are, they're pretty stable. Uh, I know that the patient's going to be comfortable. And I know that their refractive uh, change is going to be minimal from these. And I know these blebs are going to be good looking blebs, uh, like you all are in Utah here, uh, and, and diffused and well functioning. Although, of course, long term, we always think about wound healing. And for that reason, actually, I'm actually using more mitomycin C, even more because I know these blebs are not the typical blebs that typically are at risk. So target IOP, you know, I think does probably still play a role in terms of what the level of disease is, yes, but I can tell you that for me, if you're more than mild, I want you less than 15 if you're gonna live more than 10 years. Because I know, and we know, that progression is a big threat. And I think, although internal mixed procedures like the, like the canal procedures and the supercritical procedures have high safety, they're not gonna get you low enough, but for the cataract patient with early disease, I think it's certainly very reasonable because, again, of the benefit of medication reduction. But blebs are still important as ever, and I think that that's something we learned. EGS guidelines, you can see, again, start monotherapy, target not reach, add a second drug, target not reach, substitute or other therapy. I think that MIGS is kind of now messing it up a little bit in terms of changing, changing where we're looking at these things as well. Um, we have a lot of options in front of you. I mean, it's, it's a busy field out there with all the options available around the world. It's very confusing. A lot of them have very limited data. And I think time will tell us in terms of where we need to go, of course. And all the different variables that play into the role. For me, when I make a decision about a procedure, am I combining with cataract? Is that the main reason for the surgery? Or is it because of their glaucoma? Is the target pressure controlled or not controlled? How far are we, are we from the target pressure? Severity early or, or moderate to advanced? Medication tolerability and age all play a role in that. And each of these procedures have a certain target range, I think, as far as where they may fit. And again, as you know, I like to play in the space again closer to 12 for more patients with moderate disease. So yeah, I, I, I think we're changing the paradigm a little bit. You know, to be honest with you, I, had this, I, I made this slide up five years ago. So <laughs> I said five years from now. So maybe we said 10 years from now. We're not, we're not there yet. I can tell you in my practice though, I mean more than ever, we are introducing surgery at an earlier time, whether it's combined with cataract or whether it's done uh, as a standalone procedure. And I, I, and I think we need to get, again, prove that these visual fields will be stable uh, with a surgical procedure. Although, again, the evidence is, pretty, is, still, is still pretty important as we presented earlier. So, again, you know, think about glaucoma as a disease that is not stable. Any of you who write down glaucoma stable in your impression, I think, unfortunately, you're, you're, you're probably uh, not right, unfortunately. Uh, I think we always do our best with what therapies we have. And just like in other parts of medicine, as our procedures and our, and our techniques improve, I think we're more willing to be more interventional and more aggressive. Uh, and I see ourselves moving more and more forward in that level with drug delivery as well, drug elution, wound healing. Uh, and of course, I'd love to retire the bleb, but I think the bleb is still certainly here more, more, more than ever. Uh, thank you again for listening to me here uh, for this talk and uh, thinking about glaucoma. Um, again, uh, great to be here, and I, and I, I enjoy the, lecture, the talks in, in the morning. I mean, high-quality stuff being produced out of the Moran, which I'm very proud of. I, again, I, 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 I'm part of the community. I'm part of the family here, so I feel proud of what's being done in the Moran. And, uh, and again, keep up the great work. Um, thank you for your hospitality, both as a fellow and also in my return as well. And Alan, I love you as well, and thank you for everything you've done for me. Thank you very much. who has a pressure of 25 and early onset visual field loss in the decision you're going to do to a younger patient you do surgery today what surgery would you likely do for that patient early visual field loss pressure of 25 
young, so, so and you think surgery is indicated? So this patient is not going to cataract surgery. Right. right. So for me, uh, you know, that patient need, needs to have external filtration. I think going internally won't be enough. <clears throat> Canal or supraciliary space are probably going to end up being in the high teens and or more medicated. Uh, that patient, again, for me, is a microstenting, you know, blood procedure. The, the external uh, one, probably, so the, you get it in the right place. That, that would be most consistent, although, again, it's obviously a bit more work. I think, for the, for, I think that's probably where the debate is internal and external. I think we're still going to that debate, but no question. Externally, you know where you are. You actually, actually know exactly where you are. Um, and so I think that's the patient that, that, that I would think about seriously about thinking about going externally with a safer procedure. Yes, sir. Have you had much experience with MIGs and kids? It's a tough population for us here. Yeah, so, um, you know, I mean, I, I do a lot of goniotomies, uh, tracheotomies in kids, and I think that some of these newer options, I think, are, are attractive. The GAP procedure, for example, I'll, I'll do them in kids. Um, I think, you know, kids are obviously hard to treat and hard, hard to uh, manage. Uh, I haven't ventured in, into the supercarital space for kids. I, I do think there's going to be limited value uh, with, the, with the healing propensity. Um, you know, stenting, stenting in the canal, uh, you know, in, in kids I still, I'm still an apt to cut. So doing goniotomies again would be my preference. Uh, beyond that though, uh, I think that, for example, uh, the in-focus procedure, I think is a very viable option. Uh, you know, we don't like doing monomycin traps in kids. We don't really like big tubes in kids. And I think the, uh, these uh, micro-stenting approaches, I think, are, have a lot of potential. Uh, you know, we even feel comfortable doing them inferiorly because these blebs are so posterior, they're not the typical anterior you know, blebs that we worry about, at least for the in-focus procedure. So, um, I, I, and I've done a number of kids now, you know, slowly that's, that number, that the age limit is going lower and lower as far as my comfort level in that population. Yeah. I, uh, as you know, Clive Victor, who wrote the aging, talked talking about the 12 as the pressure to age break will cause since about 1988. Yeah, yeah. Well, they presented that in, uh, in LA, about 93 or 4, I was in the audience, and the book <laughs> yes, I know. I I've, I've heard that personally. I've heard that personally, yes. And, uh, and they were called excessively aggressive surgeons and so on. Well, I'm sorry we died at death, and then the American study came out, which really didn't jive with results that Clyde and Roger showed. And they, they sort of been pushing 12 all these years. Right? So it's interesting how... But, but remember, the American study overall didn't show it on visual field. It did show it on optic nerve progression. But when you actually look at the patients who had moderate disease, like minus eight to minus 10 decibels on average, it did show that surgery was superior. Uh, so I mean, that, 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 that took a bit of time to show that the preliminary results were like overall the whole group. But that's always, that's always a problem in the study when you have, when you have a bit of a dichotomous population, early, early patients and more moderate patients. Assuming they're all gonna behave the same, of course, can, can be a problem. And when you looked at more moderate patients, th these patients did, did, did do better with surgery. So that actually did actually, actually uh, support what, uh, what, what Clive and what Roger were saying. But it didn't change practice, though. It didn't change practice. Yeah, I think most of us, when we read something out of our field, I know I do this, I look at the introduction, and I look at the conclusion. Yeah. And this data, which you very cleverly analyzed, yeah. is sort of lost to us. It is. It is, yeah. So just, just an interesting, I, I'd appreciate your thought about this as well. If you look at the glaucoma group historically, as a group, they were dead set against intraocular lenses. They were dead set against FACO. They were dead set against FACO. What Alan clear up into the 2000s. Yeah. And so I wonder if part of the issue we ran into is the traditional glaucoma people were not very comfortable with surgery, and therefore, rather than say that was the issue, they said we think surgery is too aggressive. And now we've got, and, and Alan is really. I mean, those of you here, Alan's, Alan's led the way. Yeah. For the leader Alan's led the way of those people, and, and it used to be. The, the idea that you were a good cataract surgeon and a good glaucoma surgeon was almost an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. and, and Alan is the start of that, and then clearly other people like I have taken that on, and suddenly we have people very comfortable with surgery and with a whole new, and I think that's what's now starting to cause a paradigm shift. What do you think about that? Uh, totally cultural change, total cultural change, and we're seeing it in the type of applicants we see now in glaucoma fellowships, you know, surgically inclined fellows as opposed to maybe those that maybe not as much, and. Well, no question. Years ago, you went to the glaucoma fellowship because you didn't weren't particularly interested in doing surgery. Yeah, it's not. I don't want to knock glaucoma, you know, my, my peeps either, right? But uh, <laughs> but I think that that is somewhat uh, somewhat true. I think, and uh, I think that does result in a bit of conservatism or a bit uh, a bit of uh, you know skepticism with these approaches. And glaucoma also is a tougher nut to crack as well, mind you. But I can tell you now, Alan has borne the scars 
of uh, not only of, of glaucoma, but also IOLs and cataracts, and you as well, Rand, and others as well, oh have had to deal with the, uh, the, 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 you know, the community. Uh, and yeah, I've presented the AGS many times, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a tough time, right? You know, so, but I see things are changing a little bit, and they're, and they're changing. You know, and I, even, even cataract surgeons are coming around to glaucoma surgeons because even the ASCRS, we voted Gray Brown to give the innovators talk this year. Yep. That's a real yep. step to have a glaucoma guy give an innovator's talk. I mean, again, that was considered an oxymoron. And, and I think it was really nice to see Ray go over the history of the glaucoma devices and, and how we're evolving now and how cataract surgeons themselves, not only glaucoma specialists, can start looking at being involved in some of these procedures. Absolutely, so Nick. You're right. I think that this you're, you're on to the future now. You're on top of the way. Well, and, and, and to add on top of it, even 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 uh, lucky enough, I was able to get the Bing course as well. That was on glaucoma, which was right. shocking, right, to everybody. Right. And so I said it. I said at that Bing course lecture. I said, you know, in the future, we'll see the name change, name change here, ASCGRS. <laughs> okay, so w watch for that. And our and our and our presidents have been glaucoma, uh, been glaucoma specialists, right? You know, so uh, absolutely, it's, we see that happening. All of you do cataract surgery are glaucoma specialists, actually, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And I think both you and he have made an enormous difference to how they approach this. Well, I'm not, I'm not in the cost category, but uh, whatever, we can add, whatever we can add in there, in there for sure. So in your practice, uh, the trap is going? On you know, on, on, honestly, uh, the reason we do traps are, are two reasons. One, I mean, the patient who's, who's norepressor glaucoma, and I want to get them down to eight, which is not common, and it's hard to get to. And honestly, for our fellowship training, we need our fellows to know how to do a good traps and manage trap post-operative issues. So that's the main reason why we do traps, actually. But do you think that, you. that the trap procedure has not changed over so many years, and that's the reason that the traps are not giving long-term good outcomes? Well, I mean, tra traps still can give good outcomes. It's just that you know, but you know, it's just that we're worried about some of the rare but potentially serious complications and some of the refractive recovery issues with that as well, the variability. So um, all those reasons why traps are just are just not not popular, right? There's a Whole, whole host of reasons why. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.